Good evening and welcome to this special mental health edition of Doctors on Call. I'm Dina Claybaugh, a psychotherapist and founder of Insight Counseling of Duluth and Virginia, and I will be your host for tonight's program on PTSD and trauma. Our program is here to answer your questions about mental health issues that may affect you, your family, or friends. Please call or email your questions to ask at pbsnorth.org and we will do our best to address them. The telephone numbers and email address can be found at the bottom of your screen. Our expert guests this evening are Mary Casey Ladd, a licensed marriage and family therapist with more than 45 years of experience and training in the treatment of trauma and abuse. And Jennifer Elmberg is a psychotherapist at Insight Counseling's Virginia office. Our phone and email questions are being received this evening by members of the PBS North staff who will bring them to me here in the studio. Now let's begin our discussion of PTSD and trauma. Welcome, Mary and Jennifer. Thank you. All of our guests have been so special on this program. And I have to say this evening is extra special to me personally. Uh, Jennifer, you and I went to graduate school together. Yep. I remember our first day meeting and now <laughs> we are our colleagues and, yep. and friends. Yes. Um, Mary, I met you, it'll almost be five years ago mm -hmm. and you have been a mentor to me mm -hmm. um, since that time. We have monthly meetings and every time I take an insane amount of notes, <laughs> I even brought my <laughs> notebook today because I can't imagine being with you and not wanting to write something down because <laughs> your wisdom and heart is just so mm -hmm. contagious and insightful and and many times at the end of our, our our meetings i think i've many times said i wish that this could be recorded and shared mm. well and here we are here live, we are. Here we are live. <laughs> it's it's a little traumatic no I, and and one of the things i always am saying to you is that um, I had such good um, clinical um, supervision and training, and I'm always encouraging you to make sure that your staff also get that opportunity to continue to grow and learn. Yeah. So I, I'm here because of so many yeah. people who poured their wisdom into me. Well, thank you for passing yeah. it on. <clears throat> and I'm excited to have this conversation. So PTSD and trauma. I thought, well, I also want to mention that this is a topic that we hope our conversation you will find very validating and supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also a topic that can bring up some feelings and emotions and, and even overwhelm. And if you're feeling that way, we wanted to be sure to have uh, phone numbers, emergency support phone numbers and such that will be on the screen um, and encourage you to contact them if you need to. Um, that said, PTSD and trauma. I mean, PTSD we know from our diagnostic manuals is post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, I guess when I think about, you know, there's the diagnostic um, criteria mm -hmm. and we know, I know the history of having, for instance, war veterans who are experiencing, you know, and we're diagnosing. Um, trauma can be quite broad um, and has evolved over time. And I believe we're going to maybe even talk about uh, I, Bessel van der Kolk's, Dr. van der Kolk's bo mm -hmm. book, excuse me, The Body Keeps the Score, which has really um, transformed the way we're talking about trauma, the way we're treating trauma and so on. So I hope to talk about that. When I look at and conceptualize trauma um, and post-traumatic stress, traumatic stress, I see trauma being wound and stress being a constriction or a narrowing kind of I see that when I'm supporting clients in that it kind of narrows or constricts maybe our experience, our experience with ourselves as well as with our world um, and what we're navigating. Uh, trauma too, um, uh, Dr. Gabor Mate will say it disconnects us from our bodies. Mm -hmm. Again, that kind of making small and closing in. So that said, I guess in your work and, and what you've um, done to date, how, how have you seen PTSD and trauma? Mary, we'll start with you. How have you seen it um, manifest? And Well, I, no. I've been practicing now for almost um, 50 years. And so <laughs> over that time, it's changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. So we didn't get the term post-traumatic stress disorder until 1980. And it was generally attached to our returning um, vets from Vietnam. 
And now we have seen it expand um, into looking at issues that have to do with single event traumas, such as a, a terrible car accident, mm -hmm. or we see the trauma that can be associated with, um, with domestic violence, sexual abuse. Um, and generally, we're looking at um, events that can leave an individual really terrified for their well-being and their life. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and certainly, um, Dr. Um, Bezel van der Kolk has transformed and given mm -hmm. us just a new lens through which to understand the long-term effects of untreated trauma. Mm -hmm. That unresolved trauma, as I see, is kind of hiding behind some of these presentations such as anxiety, depression, anger, so on and so forth. And in fact, I'm thinking of an interview that you shared with me recently uh, with uh, Dr. Van der Kuyken, and, and we described this, if you were to see a person running down the street, mm -hmm. uh, flailing their arms, screaming, and, and just you know out of, out of their skin, uh, would you think they're a little crazy? Would you go help them? And a lot of people might say no. Right, they mm -hmm. would, would be scared of them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And now, say you see that person and you see a full-grown tiger coming around the corner running after that person. <laughs> would you think that they're crazy? No. 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 Would you help them? Yes. <laughs> yeah. that it, so the context changes mm -hmm. um, our response to the person who's suffering. Right. So, so validating, mm -hmm. right? I mean, his work has been so validating um, and helping us kind of peel back the layers and, and look at what's behind some of the, you know, some of, for instance, anger or um, so on. How about you, Jennifer? Can you describe a little bit about how, what you've seen in your work? Um, so I agree with everything that Mary said and then as well as like also um, intergenerational trauma. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as it's passed down, as we see through families, um, and you see that a lot, you know, if you work with kids, if you work, you know, it's not just the person who's there in front of you, it's also, your, you know, their mom, their dad, their grandma, their aunties, their, mm -hmm. you know, all of their family, because as, you know, studies have come out that have shown how those chemical marks make a, you know, mm -hmm. the stress makes a chemical that mm -hmm. makes a mark on your mm -hmm. DNA. Mm -hmm. and causes you know it to pass down through generations mm -hmm. and so we see mm -hmm. you know a, as well as behaviors and things that like that's just how my family has always done it well mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. that's also intergenerational trauma mm -hmm. um, and so that's how I have seen it come um, across in a lot of the work that I have done not you know not just with kids but mm -hmm. also um, young adults and, right. and yeah so on. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that because that does also just a context um, for those of you who are just joining us. We're having a discussion around PTSD and trauma and just trauma, including generational trauma, mm -hmm. developmental trauma, mm -hmm. um, relational trauma, vicarious, secondary trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, we're seeing that a lot with first responders yes. and, and so on. So there's so many ways to conceptualize yeah. what we're talking about mm -hmm. tonight. Mm -hmm. And we're already getting a stack of questions. <laughs> um, how long does the body hold on to a traumatic experience? Does it ever resolve itself? Mary. This, you know, that um, important question because we could experience the same event mm -hmm. and have a very, very different response. I could ha experience a trauma with that that affects my brain that affects how my body operates. And Jennifer might be distressed by it, but that it wouldn't have some of the lingering mm -hmm. um, long-term effects from the trauma. So the, the answer to that is that it depends. Mm -hmm. it, and it depends a great deal on what I bring, what this body brings to that traumatic event. And, um, and I think Dr. Van der Kolk really spells this out in his book the body keeps the score, as he understands um, and really looks at what's my regulatory capacity just in life to deal with stress. Some of us don't have a very good ability to kind of to deal with um, frightening or scary or stressful things. Mm -hmm. Our sympathetic nervous system really, really gets 
jarred. Mm -hmm. And we have a hard time bringing the calm down. Um, I, say, I would say to clients that if, if a car was gonna come and hit me, I will have this, the stress response. My biology automatically, I don't have to think about it. My heart rate goes mm -hmm. faster, my breathing is more shallow, um, energy goes to my Reflexes, limbs, right? Yeah. And a couple blocks later, whew, I can calm down. Somebody who's experienced some significant unresolved trauma, that state in their own bodies might stay elevated for hours or maybe days mm -hmm. or a very long time. So when we look at how do we, we, we're getting, we're learning so much more over the course of my career the, the evidence-based interventions that we have, and, and you two are getting trained in interventions that I have not been trained in, mm -hmm. that are showing remarkable results. Mm -hmm. And so, and we are looking at treating not just the mind, the body, which we can't separate, um, but you know, also really helping people develop um, a, a sense of their own um, spiritual beliefs that mm -hmm. we, we all need Mm -hmm. to to help us get through some of the suffering that will inevitably come our way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That so that approach too reminds me of I, I think in our field at least we'll mm -hmm. talk about the top down top down versus bottom up approach mm -hmm. and finding that in order to I mean reconnect that body and that nervous system right is this bottom up approach. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, I know, you know, with EMDR and ART, somatic, I mean, can you talk a little bit about how you support clients? with that sort of bottom-up approach? So with EMDR or ART, um, so EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitization um, and Reprocessing, and ART stands for Accelerated Resolution Therapy. Um, very similar, but they're both uh, memory reconsolidation um, techniques. And so essentially we're taking the way that your body um, because the way our brains turn those you know, events, whatever event we might experience, is um, if it's a very strong emotional attachment, you know, obviously we feel it kind of throughout our body, our heart, you know, like you were talking about Mary, the heart starts beating, all of that. We have that very somatic response to the event. And then it, you know, gets stored in our brain and our body holds on to that for years and years to come. And so with interventions like EMDR or ART, what we're doing is we're taking that kind of old memory mm -hmm. um, and we're kind of helping the body, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of mm -hmm. like opening back up the file and editing it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we're helping the body be able to kind of let go of that memory. So you might still remember it, but it doesn't hold the emotional weight. You don't feel that emotion in your body, you know, mm -hmm. which I always, I love yeah. the term um, emotion is energy in motion. And that's, mm -hmm. I, I love that because mm -hmm. it's, you, that's how you feel them. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, mm -hmm. really what we're doing with ART. And I love too that the body wants to do that. Yes, You know, yes. like a wound, a cut in your yep. hand it's like that your wants to White heal. blood cells just, wants just go the, there and, you know, yep. The, the elements, the fa on, you know, to be able to do that and that's what we're doing. Yep. How about, okay, outside of the clinical setting, we have a question from Mark in Superior. How do we support someone with PTSD? And I think we should even take that. How, how can families and friends support their friend or family member if they know they have PTSD or trauma? Well, there's certainly tremendous um, uh, information that's available to us online. And mm -hmm. I think the first thing is to be able to understand um, some of the complexity of it and, um, and to have a, um, I think that, that ability to, to recognize what some of the symptoms are. Because some of the symptoms can be rage that somebody can go zero to 100. Mm -hmm. Somebody can start having flashbacks or memories um, of in events that you know the, the family member or the friend might think, man, you've been talking about this for years or you process this, mm -hmm. you're still hanging on to this. So getting some of that kind of information and understanding how that individual is experiencing it, and it can be in our arousal system, you know, sometimes we've, we've misdiagnosed kids with ADHD who had untreated trauma, um, that, we've, um, that we've judged or even labeled people who have a difficulty forming an attachment 
because there are there's huge mm. trust issues there. So, so the first thing I think is to really be able to um, to find some of those resources and. You know, Vanderkoek has just lovely um, YouTube videos <laughs> out there. So the first thing is to get some information and to really try to refrain from um, labels and judgment because that will not create the safety that's always necessary for the healing process. I would even add to just not, you know, I think so often we want to just run in and fix you know, mm -hmm. and fix, mm -hmm. and you know, and it's not necessarily something that can just be fixed overnight. And so just being that support mm -hmm. person, mm -hmm. knowing that you're providing a safe, you know, space for that person to um, experience mm -hmm. their emotions and, you know, whatever they're experiencing, mm -hmm. I think is highly valuable mm -hmm. when it comes to supporting somebody who has PTSD. Mm -hmm. How about, Jennifer, I'm going to go back to you because okay. I know <laughs> this is an area that, that you're very skilled in. Is meditation helpful for PTSD? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. A, re a resounding yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah very, maybe, very easy. <laughs> and maybe share any favorite resources you have. Yeah. Just, just like you mentioned YouTube and online. There's so many. Oh, there is so many. Um, yeah. One of my favorites is... Um, there's a app called Insight Timer, and um, it has nothing to do with Insight Counseling, but <laughs> it just so happens that the names are mm -hmm. similar. But um, Insight Timer has a whole, you know, plethora of uh, different meditations. Some for trauma, actually, you can, you know, just kind of type into the little search bar in it. Um, Waking Up is an app that you, Dina, uh, recently shared with me, um, and that has a lot of just great resources but meditation can be great and it, I mean it doesn't I think when people think of meditation I and I know I definitely being one of them you know people think like you have to sit down and clear your mind and whatever and that is so not what mm -hmm. it is I mean it can really be just these short one to two to three minute you know little jaunts where you're just kind of being mindful of what you're experiencing mm -hmm. right now in this moment and so it just helps bring your you know your body and mind really to the same page you know I mean they're in the same vessel so you might as well yeah. <laughs> break them on the same page yeah yep. imminent excellent so that we go. we think about you know that that our our nervous system which gets so um, um, challenged with a trauma that we have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. And they kind of, they, they're like a teeter-totter. When one's mm -hmm. up, the other's down. Mm -hmm. When we're in danger, the sympathetic nervous system takes over and it is high alert. That's why we, we, c we will have constant kind of um, ruminating thoughts about being in danger or not feeling okay. Mm -hmm. Our body doesn't feel very good. So the meditation is actually trying to bring the parasympathetic yes. nervous system out of the basement <laughs> and yep. back online. And with chronic stress, for, for those of us who grew up in chronically stressed families, mm -hmm. our parasympathetic nervous system doesn't come back by itself. Mm -hmm. And that's where that intentional yoga, mm -hmm. the meditation, um, a, a good walk in the woods, I mean, that is, mm -hmm. we're trying to create a sense or trying to tell the brain mm -hmm. through the body, mm -hmm. you're not, you're okay. There is not a tiger chasing you mm -hmm. and you're just having some memories. But sometimes our body can get triggered with um, some kind of an activation or what we would talk about as a trigger. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then it can get our thoughts kind of back into the trauma. And meditation, thank you, Mary and Jennifer, is it is a practice too, it right? Is. You build up a stamina, mm -hmm. just like we can't go run a marathon right. Right, tomorrow without training. Uh, that's meditation. And even mm -hmm. I say three to five minutes a day yep. of focused mm -hmm. attention short, and little things, silence. Little yeah. snippets. And even, you know, like finding a good trauma informed yoga class, mm -hmm. I think that can also you know, kind of bring that practice of meditation because you're really, with trauma-informed yoga, mm -hmm. you're, you're really just honoring what your body wants as well as your mind and, you know, just what you need in that space. I've been telling great. clients um, since my sister-in-law introduced me to her, 
um, yoga with Adrian. Yes. It's like, oh, I love that. Uh, yeah, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's like having like one of the best therapists that yeah. comes and visits you every it morning. It is. Oh, yeah. I love her bedtime there too. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Let's see, Rusty has a question. I think I have PTSD from my school days. Mm -hmm. And we have had some questions. We have a lot of questions tonight. Yeah, I'm that. excited. Um, and we've had a lot of questions around bullying as well, so yes. that can be included in here. I think I have PTSD from school days. Can childhood trauma still manifest today? Absolutely, yes. Jennifer. I mean, I think, yeah, we can, it just like how we were talking earlier about how the body holds on to memory and, you know, our, our mind holds on to, to memory or to, you know, events there it is I, you have a trigger and then that brings up an image mm -hmm. and you know with mm -hmm. EMDR we call it the Tyses mm -hmm. or you know so trigger image cognition emotion and sensation you have this whole experience after you have you know after something triggers you and that's not you know there that's there's a lot of things that can cause that let's see Andrew asks can you speak about the availability of trauma and grief therapy today Mary mm -hmm. The, I just um, am pleased to say that we have so many trauma-informed therapists mm -hmm. in our communities, as well as the school districts ha are doing training mm -hmm. on trauma-based curriculum. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I think that, that anyone who um, is, is um, practicing in our community, um, mm -hmm. I think has had a lot of exposure and awareness to mm -hmm. these treatments. Now some of us, and you know that that the EMDR and the um, ART are um, are their newer interventions in the in say the mm -hmm. last ten years. Mm -hmm. So you can actually ask when you call a therapist. You know how how mm -hmm. well have you been trained in um, specific trauma or mm -hmm. in um, some of the the evidence based interventions? Because I can look back on my career. And I know that I that talk therapy can sometimes be re-traumatizing. Mm -hmm. And there are clients that I would go back to and apologize because I didn't know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. But we have to supplement um, the process about not just exposing the person to, to have to go back into the memory, mm -hmm. but it's about how do we get the resolution and how do we get what we're really talking about is the healing mm -hmm. of that mind, body, spirit. Right. And feeling safe, yes, and connected. Right, mm -hmm. I think that is so important. Very. Um, oh, let's see. Last we have time <laughs> for one more question. Um, ben says, "Can you please talk about how some people are more resilient after trauma? Mm -hmm. You know, and and maybe mention a little bit about post-traumatic growth. And we've kind of touched on some of this. Jennifer, anything else you would add on how some people are um, more resilient?" More resilient. Um, I think that's, it's really, it's hard to say what exactly, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, there's so many studies out there that, you know, support lots of different mm -hmm. things. Um, I think recently, maybe it was last fall, um, I had went to the, uh, there was a training at the College of St. Scholastica on um, gender studies or whatever, but they were talking about um, just children having the more positive experiences children have in their communities with safe adults mm -hmm. and things like that mm -hmm. a lot of times sets them up to have more um, resilience yes. to you know Trump traumatic events mm -hmm. as they get older and I think that that is so true for for a lot of us you know it's just yeah. the more positive kind of experiences you have and the more um, kind of safe relationships that you have um, creates resilience in a lot of ways. And, and Dr. Steve Wolin wrote a book called The Resilient Self. Mm -hmm. And we brought um, Dr. Wolin here in the 90s to, to talk to our clinicians. That's cool. And, and he's, he's studied people who came out of alcoholic families who did not become alcoholic. And mm -hmm. he started seeing a pattern and he, then he was able to identify seven different types of resiliencies. Hmm. And it's a really, and it's a way of beginning to have um, a more compassionate understanding about not what's wrong with us,
but mm -hmm. an understanding about what happened to what us. What happened mm -hmm. to us, yeah. Bruce Perry's recent mm -hmm. book, What mm -hmm. Happened to You, mm -hmm. um, is a beautiful mm -hmm. um, book as well to read. We just have time maybe for one more question. Again, there were some questions about <laughs> bullying and, and such. How can parents support children or teens if they suspect that there's some bullying happening? Well, the, when Mary. we're talking about bullying, we're talking about um, an experience about how a kid is shamed for who they are. And, um, and we have to be very intentional about helping the kids begin to learn how to identify those shame-based thoughts and how to help them understand that that shame voice is lying to them about who they are. So it's about, I want you to believe me, that I see you, I delight in you, mm. and those kids don't see you clearly. But it's really, really hard for a mm -hmm. kid to, um, to be able to believe yeah. that. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we're, I could have, we could keep talking all night, I wish. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we will, but not with, with the world watching. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I want to thank our panelists, Mary Casey Ladd and Jennifer Elmberg, for their time and expertise tonight. And for those of you who called or emailed in your questions, please join Dr. Ray Christensen next week for a program on end of life issues when his guests will be Dr. Jeff Copeman, Dr. Colt Eden, and Dr. Amy Greminger. I'm Dina Claybaugh. For the guests and crew here at PBS North, thank you for watching. Good night.